So welcome to your complete beginner's guide to investing. And this video is gonna be for anyone who wants to get started investing, and I'm gonna keep things super simple. As if I went back 10 years ago, sat myself down to explain everything that I know now. I'm not going to assume that you need to know any special knowledge or qualifications, and I'll walk you through the whole process from start to finish, so you'll be in a position to get started today, or at least understand a lot more than you do now, because honestly, you can do this, and it's not as complicated as lots of people try and make out. I'll have all the sections timestamped for you, so please feel free to go back over things if you wanna watch part of the video again another time. For now though, let's get started from the beginning. So just before you start throwing your money all over the place, let's just remember why we're doing this in the first place and why we actually need to invest our money. I think it's kind of like going to the gym and keeping fit. You do it because it feels good, you sleep better and you know it's good for you in the long term, but you also know that you can't just go one time and expect to be Mr or Mrs Universe. But taking a step back even further, we need to invest to make sure that our money doesn't lose value to inflation. Basically, if you're Superman or Superwoman and this represents your money as an investor, then inflation is your kryptonite. It's your arch nemesis and it's that thing that we have to be, otherwise you'll end up losing over time. A good example might be looking at the cost of a pint of milk over time. If we look back at the mid-1970s, a pint of milk was 6p. And now if we fast forward to today, it's around 67p, which is more than 10 times the cost over that 50 years. So what this means is that if you kept all of your income in cash, hid it under the bed, and never earned any interest on it or never invested it, over time you lose buying power. And that's exactly why you need to invest. You need to put your money into something that will grow, at least with inflation, but hopefully a lot more than inflation. Also, let's not forget that investing is also great for your own personal finances. If you can invest your money, it means that you're spending less money than you make, which usually means that you've done well with your budget. And in the event of unexpected things happening, it means that you've got a nest egg there to help out. So whether you want to invest to save up to buy a house, retire early, or just have a pot of cash for the future, don't forget to have a think about why you're doing it in the first place because I think it will really help keep you motivated over the years, as this is definitely not a way to get rich quick. And speaking of things to help us grow our money to beat inflation, that brings us on to our next section about what kind of things you can actually invest in. So there are loads of things that you can invest in, and this can easily be one of the most confusing parts about investing, because everyone will tell you what's the best thing to invest in, and then give their reasons why. But stepping back for a moment, remember that our goal is to invest in assets. And all that means is in something that will increase in value over time rather than lose value. Just like our example of putting money under the bed earlier. You've probably all heard of people getting rich by investing into companies like Apple, Tesla, Microsoft and Google, who've all made tons of money over the past few decades. And buying shares in these companies would be one type of asset that you could buy. But also there are loads of other kinds of assets. So you have things like bonds, commodities, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, property, cash, and even cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Although let's not get too far ahead of ourselves for now. Right, I'll explain a bit more about the different kinds of assets in a moment, but for now, let's just cover off the basics for the stock market when we talk about investing into a company. Let's take Apple as an example, as this is probably a company that you've actually heard of. Apple is actually the most valuable company in the world because when you add up all of the shares, which are currently worth around $140 each, you get to a grand total of more than $2.2 trillion. You'll see a company value also referred to its market cap, which just means market capitalization. It's just a fancy way of showing the total value of a company. So this means if you want to buy an Apple share, you'll need $140 and then once you buy a share, Congratulations, you're a shareholder and you now own part of Apple. It might not be a very big part of Apple, but you're still a business owner. So that means that you'll benefit if the company ends up doing really well. So for example, if you bought some Apple stock in 2016, the price per share was around $25. So you would have made 500% on your money to get to today's price, which is not a bad profit at all. Other than stocks in companies, there are lots of other assets that you can buy. Remember that none of us know what will be the best performing asset over the next few years. So be very skeptical if anyone claims otherwise. There's always going to be something shiny and new that people talk about on TV or here on YouTube that promises to change the world. Remember that this isn't the first time and so it won't be the last time. So just stay safe out there. Let's quickly touch on bonds and some other assets. There's always loads more detail we can go into, but we'll stick to the very basics for now for each one. Bonds are another important asset and really simply, they are just IOUs. So you give your money to a government or a company and in return they give you a fixed percentage return for a certain period of time. So just like you get a loan from a bank and borrow £5,000 for one year at an interest rate of say 10%, you now owe the bank 5000 plus 500 so 5500 with the 500 being their interest. 
With bonds, you're pretty much the bank, so you'll earn interest for investing your money. And popular bonds people often buy are sold by governments. So here in the UK, you might often hear the term UK gilt. And over in the US, you might hear the term treasury bills. And just to give you a real world example, right now, you can buy a UK gilt for a period of one year, meaning that your money's locked up for a whole year. And in return, the rate is about 3.1%. So at the end of that year, if you'd bought £1,000 worth of bonds, you'll end up with £1,031 because 3.1% of £1,000 is £31. Simples. Another asset could be commodities like oil, gold, silver, coffee, lumber, you name it, you can buy it. But we won't go into too much more detail here. And then a popular asset, especially with us Brits, is property. So this could be the house that you own and live in or even a rental property that you've bought to rent out. At the end of the day, if the price of the house goes up more than inflation, as houses have done for quite a long time, then you'll be growing your money. Also, you could class cryptocurrencies as a kind of asset as well, but we're going to focus on the stock market for this video, and that's where the majority of us will probably end up. Just be careful with some types of assets. Some are a lot riskier than others, and some have a lot more volatility, meaning that they can go up just as much as they can go down. And cryptocurrency is a good example of a new kind of asset that's extremely risky and still very new. So just be really careful when picking and choosing what you invest in. Lots of risky assets can quite easily go to zero very quickly. And just look at everything that happened with FTX so far. You have been warned. Anyway, with that aside, you're probably still a bit confused and thinking, okay, you've told me that I can buy a share of a company or even some bonds. But how am I meant to know what companies to buy, how much to spend, and then when to buy and sell? And that's where the next kind of asset comes in and one that's really changed the way that people invest over the past 40 years. It's time to talk about index funds. Let's just wrap our heads around the term index fund first. It's super simple. There are loads of indexes out there in the stock market and lots of companies have put together lists and groups of companies for us. Famous ones you've probably heard of include something like the S&P 500 over in the US, which is a collection of the 500 largest companies in North America and includes all of the big companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Tesla. Then closer to home here in the UK, you've probably heard of the famous FTSE 100 index, which just like the US, rather than being the 500 companies, is the largest 100 companies based here in the UK. There's also global indexes too. In fact, there's so many out there that there's an index for almost everything you can kind of imagine, whether it's a country, an industry, or the entire world. Now, an index fund is when money is invested together into a certain index. So rather than picking your own companies and having to buy one share, of every company on the S&P 500, for example, you could just buy a share of an S&P 500 index fund. And that fund will then invest the money into each company depending on how large it is. So the larger the company, the larger their share of the fund. So remember earlier we spoke about market cap. Apple has the largest. So out of the S&P 500 index, it makes up about 6.5% at the time of making this video. This means that for every £100 or $100 that you invest into this fund, £6.50 or $6.50 would go into Apple. And then so on as you work your way down the list as it goes smaller and smaller and smaller. If you're still a little confused, you could think about an index fund like the Football Premier League. That's just the best football teams in the UK on a list. The biggest teams would get the most investment and then the smaller ones would get less of our money. Although the funny thing is, anyone could win the league on any given year, which is actually quite a good comparison on the stock market. And also over time, just like the Premier League, indexes like the S&P 500 or the FTSE 100, they'll change depending on who the big companies are. So the weak companies or the ones that go bust will end up just getting relegated, just like your local team did. We could talk loads about the history of index funds, but just briefly, they were created back in the mid 1970s by John Bogle, who founded Vanguard, one of the largest investment companies in the world still to this day. And they got really popular with investors, especially retail investors like us, for a couple of reasons. One was that they were very low cost to own because they kept those ongoing fees low. And the other was that, believe it or not, most of the time they beat the performance of even the professionals who picked their own stocks. Bogle saw that very few fund managers who made their own list of stocks did very well because they just tried to get as much money for themselves as possible by charging very high fees and constantly traded in and out of companies trying to make profits. By creating the index fund, the idea was that you just buy the whole market and then you benefit as the market grows because over time, more profits are made. Also, you save yourself a huge amount of time and hassle because you don't have to spend any time at all looking at company financials, trying to work out if a business is good investment or not. Trust me, it's worth it. Now, other than index funds, which can also be known as passive funds or tracker funds, there are loads of other funds out there which are actively managed. 
meaning that the manager makes their own stock picks for you and tries to get more money, at least that's the idea. There are mutual funds, exchange traded funds, and lots of mixed funds too that already include stocks and bonds all together for you. So you don't have to worry about trying to put things together. There's even funds for AI companies, electric cars, gold mining companies, high paying dividend stocks. There's literally thousands out there, so just be careful. Now, rather than going into loads of detail on each one, just pay attention to a couple of key things if you are looking at different funds. Make sure, most importantly, that you pay attention to the fees and the charges. You want to check if there's any cost to buy into the fund firstly, which can be quite common in actively managed ones, but then also look out for the ongoing costs. You'll sometimes see this referred to as the OER, which means ongoing expense ratio, or TER, which stands for total expense ratio. And these are just fancy terms which show you, as a percentage each year, how much of your investment goes to pay the fees of the managers. Rather than taking this from me, let me play you a really short clip of the late John Bogle talking about how fees and charges affect how much money you can end up with in your investing career. Just have a listen to this. We all get a return from the stock market in the long run the returns created by American business. Now let's say for the purpose of argument that that's an 8% return. That's what we all share. There's no way around it. We, you know, in an 8% market, we don't share 8.5%, nor do we share 6.5%, whatever it might be. We share eight. So that is the gross return that's created by American business. But we in the markets get the net return after the insanely high costs of financial intermediation. And those can be as much as say 2% a year. And it's very high. It's not only management fees, administrative fees, marketing costs, uh, turnover costs. Funds are constantly buying and selling securities. And it turns out to be about 2% less than the market return. So when we all earn 8%, say, we all get 6%, and which people don't think nearly enough about. Over an investment lifetime, uh, we, we, are, we put up 100% of the capital. We take 100% of the risk and we get about 30% of the market's long-term return. So in short, fees and charges really matter. And let me just show you two examples. First up, here's a passive index fund from Vanguard, one that I actually own myself. And you can find it by searching VUSA if you ever wanna find it on any investment platform. This fund, as you can see, has an ongoing cost of 0.07% per year. So that means that for every 1,000 pound you have invested, just 70p will be lost to fees each year. Now, let me show you an actively managed fund that was very popular with retail investors managed by Kathy Wood, the Art K Fund. Here you can see that this fund has a cost of 0.75%. So that means for every £1,000 in this fund, you'd actually be paying £7.50 each year, making it more than 10 times expensive than the passive fund we just saw. Now, at the end of the day, none of us know what fund will do best in five years, 10 years, or even 20 years. And you could end up doing better in an actively managed fund like that. But history so far has shown us that it's very difficult to do and very few managers end up doing well in the long term. If you're interested in the latest figures, just so you don't have to take my word for it, have a look at this chart on screen now. This shows out of all of the active managed funds in the stock market, which ones managed to beat the passive index funds. And unfortunately, the results speak for themselves. Over a period of 10 years, between 79% and 86% of the funds do not beat the market. So that means that less than 20% of the thousands of fancy funds out there can't be a cheap and simple index fund. So just be aware of that and be really careful. I'm not saying don't buy individual stocks and pick your own as I also do buy some myself, but I do want to just make sure that you know the risks and show you that it's not as easy as some people make it seem from the outside. Anyway, now with that explained, we've spoken about the different kinds of assets we can invest in. So that leads us to really getting into the exciting part. What do you choose to invest in and how do you go about making those decisions? Okay, deep breath, this one can be as easy or difficult as you make it and it will be personal to you. And it all depends on where you are in your investing journey, what your goals are, how old you are, how risky you want to be and all kinds of other things. So just remember that I'm not a financial advisor, take your time with everything and do seek professional help if you do need it. I'll speak as much from my own experience as a 34 year old with a long time horizon for investing and we'll keep everything nice and broad. So the first principle here is a little something called diversification, which just means investing in lots of different assets rather than holding too much of one thing. You'll see some of the greatest investors from the past called diversification the only free lunch in investing because it's so important to make sure that you stay well protected no matter what the future throws at you. Let me just give you an example. Pretend you have two choices. You can either invest in one big mansion worth a million pounds or a million dollars, or you can have 10 smaller houses, each worth 100K each. 
And we'll also say that the income you get from renting is gonna be exactly the same in total. We'll just call it 100K per year. Now, based on the income alone, it won't matter what one you choose. But then if we think about it from a diversification perspective, it will make a lot more sense to buy the 10 smaller houses. Here's why. Just think about all of the things that could go wrong. What if the tenants don't pay their rent on time? What if the property gets damaged in bad weather? What happens if the heating system breaks? If you only had one house, even if it's a nice big mansion, there's a lot more risk in one place. But having lots of smaller houses, you could still have the same problems, but not all of them will face the same problems at the same time. And it works the same way in the stock market and with investing. Generally speaking, you wanna make sure that you have a well-diversified portfolio. And all that means is owning lots of different kinds of things so that going back to the example just now, in case there's a big storm, you won't lose everything. I've always wanted to use storm effect in an investing video to make a point. I hope that does the trick. Anyway, one way you can be well diversified is by making sure that you own stocks in different companies which are in different industries. So for example, if you like buying Apple stock, you might also want to invest in companies in totally different businesses, maybe even an oil company or a healthcare company. This one is all about how you spread out your risk and make sure that you don't lose everything by keeping it in one place. It also works the same by saying, you probably don't want all of your investments to be just property either, as we all saw what happened in the great financial crash too. Plan for the worst and keep things well balanced that suits you, otherwise you can end up putting yourselves in a lot more risk than we might realize. Remember that, like I've said before, nobody knows the future and we also don't know what kind of asset or what kinds of stock will be the best performers next year. We can look back at history to help us, but remember, don't let that guide you too much as the famous saying goes that past performance is not a reliable indicator for future results. If we do bring up the past results though, have a look at this. It's called an asset heat map. It's just another fancy term and all it is, is a view of the different kinds of investments and what perform the best each year going back over the last 10 years. So each of these colored boxes represents an asset. So for example, US stocks, Chinese stocks, and even bonds from governments, and also some property too. Look at how much difference just one year makes and how sometimes stocks can do really well for one year, but then do really badly in the next. Check this part out that shows how back in 2017, the best performing asset was stocks in China. They went up more than 54%, which is pretty crazy in just 12 months. So imagine you were starting out in 2018 and saying, right, now I need to choose what to invest in. I better make sure I have plenty of Chinese stocks because they're going up so much recently. Well, as you can see, by the end of 2018, it turns out that that would have been a very bad decision. In fact, pretty much everything was down, but Chinese stocks went down almost 20% right there at the bottom. Now, for investing, it's more important to focus less on the short term, seeing what has done well and hoping that it does well in the next year. Focus on the long-term results, and this, I think, gives us a bit more information. So this column on the right shows us the 10-year averages. So you can see that US stocks have actually performed well on average, getting more than 13% a year, followed by infrastructure and then Japanese stocks. However, 10 years might even be too short for most long-term investors. So what about the really long-term? Well, have a look at this. Here's the S&P 500, which is pretty much a good representation of the US stock market over the last century. I've adjusted for inflation here, but see how over the long term it's grown by more than 10 times. And it's all because the economy's stronger, companies make more profit, and things generally are getting better. So just remember that unless you're gonna invest for the long term, more than five years, but ideally longer, you might be better off not investing at all, but that's up to you. Be prepared for some big jumps up, but also some big falls down too. So what is the best thing to invest in? Well, sorry to tell you that I don't know and nobody does because we don't know the future. But more importantly, I don't know you. You could be young with years ahead of you and loads of money to invest, or you could be close to retirement with a low tolerance to risk. So really it all depends. However, speaking generally, based on some of the best advice from the world's greatest investors, you're gonna to wanna to be well diversified and for the majority of people, it will be worth sticking to those trusty index funds that we spoke about earlier. Even Warren Buffett actively recommends that most people should stick to investing into index funds, even with the success he's had and the results speak for themselves. If you do want to pick your own stocks, just be warned about the risks. It's not easy and maybe take some advice from another great stock picker, Peter Lynch, one of the most successful investors in the world. I always remember his words saying, know what you own. All this means is that if you do want to buy stocks, you better really make sure that you know what they do and not just buy them because your friend at work told you they're about to go up. 
that never ends well. Anyway, index funds can give us most of the diversification we need, and you can even invest in global index funds so that you don't need to worry about whether Chinese stocks or US or even UK stocks will do well next year. Here's an idea. If you do want to keep things super simple, then you could just invest into a single index fund every month, or if you enjoy taking a few more risks, you could take a smaller part of your investing money to pick some stocks too. It really is all up to you, but this part is personal. I did a video recently on this topic, so check that out afterwards on how to build your own investment portfolio. Now, if you ever want to see what I invest in, you can follow me along on all my portfolios that I share on YouTube. I've made a playlist where you can go back each month and see how I've been getting on. But generally, most of my investing goes into index funds because they have proven themselves to be one of the most effective tools that we can use as investors without having to know really anything about individual companies or getting too complicated. So keep things simple, find what works for you and go for that. Stay safe, stay diversified and definitely be careful out there. Right, next section, how much money do you need and should you invest? In short, this one is up to you and you should invest whatever you're comfortable with. For me personally, I always consider money that I invest money that I'm not going to need or touch for many years. So I'd say, in my opinion, you should invest money that you can go without and you won't need to touch in an emergency. Also though, let's clear this one point out for you. You do not have to be rich to invest. Investing is not just for rich people and you're probably already an investor without knowing it indirectly. Your pension, for example, money that you can't touch until you're retired, will be invested into lots of different companies both here in the UK and around the world. Let me use some examples again because I think that always helps. And I'll show you the power of investing relatively small amounts of money. The key thing though is to think long term. So let's say that we can invest £200 a month for 20 years. If we get an average interest rate of 10%, which is close to what you might have got over the last 20 years in the real stock market, and we'll also increase our investments by 5% a year just to make sure that we can keep up with inflation, we end up with £214,730. But here's the cool part. You've put in 79360 over that whole 20 years. So the rest of that, more than half, is from interest and your gains. I've shown this a few times before on the channel, but I really think, again, it's always worth mentioning but it does take time for this to work and there aren't any get rich quick shortcuts. If you see this chart for how you start to make money, the orange bars are your total gains from interest. And after about 15 years is when you've made more money than you've actually put in. So hopefully you'll agree it's really, really powerful, but you got to stick with it. Some great advice I've heard before says that you spend less than you make and then invest the rest. And I changed that to my own version that says invest if you can. There's no pressure to invest the same money each month as you get paid, but I do think that if you can create some good habits with investing, then it does become easier. And if you can treat it like an essential bill, it means that you won't skip it every time you want to buy something nice. Also, if you can invest more as you get a pay rise or get a bonus from work, that will always be good. And the sooner you get the money working for you, the better, but it has to be in there for a long time, like we said. Right, this is a great topic and it's probably one that investors ask the most when they want to start. Is now a good time to start investing and should I maybe wait for a better time? Let's be really clear, it's always a good time to start investing. I actually did a video on this topic a while ago, so feel free to check that one out on my channel later. And please, already, if you are enjoying the video and finding it really useful, please hit the like button for me. Subscribe too as well, it really does help small UK creators like me in this finance space. Anyway, back to the subject of time. It's always a good time, only if you're a long-term investor and you're also going to invest using index funds. If you're going to be picking individual stocks or you're going to make trades, buying and selling all the time, then of course today or next week or next month might not be the best time because that will all depend. Generally speaking though, the sooner the better would almost always be a great rule to follow. And I've yet to meet an investor who said that they wish they hadn't started earlier. Everyone wishes they could have done it years ago and gone back in time. It goes without saying that if you are young, you'll have more advantages because let's say you're 25 years old now and you can start investing, you'll be in a much better position than a 45 year old. But age is just one factor. And if the 45 year old could invest more than the youngster, then you could catch them up over time. Just like the example we did earlier talking about how much you should invest. If you invest over many years, you get compound interest working for you, which is an investor's best friend. Here's where the old saying comes in that time in the market beats timing the market because time and time again, it's been shown through various studies in the real world that trying to buy at the bottom of the market when it looks cheap and selling right at the top when it all looks expensive is not something any of us can do, at least reliably. We might get lucky once or twice, but it's just not worth wasting your time. And that's just not an opinion, it's the cold hard facts. Also, let's not forget that if you do try and time the market and you buy in and out frequently, 
you could end up costing yourself a lot in trading fees, taxes, and let's not forget about the mental strain as well. Most of you, I'm sure, just like me, don't really want to spend every hour of the day trying to work out if we're making the right investment or not. So the more time you spend having to do research and not sure if you've done the right thing will definitely take its toll. So some of the best advice I've read from some of the best investors out there just says not to bother doing it. Another great quote from Peter Lynch says that more money's been lost trying to time those market corrections than would have been lost in the actual crashes themselves. And we see it time and time again. So the best time to invest is right now, or at least wait until the end of the video before you're ready. There are lots of risks to investing, just like there are risks in almost everything you do in life. You can't expect to have a chance to grow your wealth and beat inflation if you don't take some kind of risks. Otherwise, we'd all just do it risk-free. So it's really important that you understand as an investor that yes, you can lose money, and yes, you can end up with less during certain periods. However, the key thing is to remember that you only lose or make money when you actually sell. I know that sounds obvious, but lots of people like to look at their investing accounts and say, wow, I'm up 10,000 this year or something like that. But unless they sell, it's just the value at one point in time. Next year, it could be back to no profit at all. So just keep that in mind. Now, when it comes to risk, this is really going to be personal to you. And it's important to find out what levels of risk that you like taking. Generally speaking, higher levels of risk can offer higher rewards, but that's not always the case with investing. So don't think that just because you're going all in on one single company that apparently will change the world, that it must have an equal amount of risk as well as reward. One way to know if you're taking too many risks is really gonna be down to how it makes you feel. And the rule of thumb I like to use is that if you can't sleep because some of the investments that you've made, then you've probably made the wrong ones or you might just not quite understand what you're buying. One way you can reduce your risk is just like we mentioned before, use diversification to your advantage. Remember, it's that free lunch that we get in investing. Many companies in the stock market have gone bust before. So if you're an investor and never sold, you would see your money go to zero. However, by having lots of companies and using things like index funds to invest in, you'll reduce your risk massively. And the only way an index fund will go to zero is if the entire economy collapses. And if that happens, honestly, I think cash will probably be one of the least useful things that you can have. And it's time to start planting some food in the garden and hiding in the basement. Just to prove a point, just look at how many technology companies went bust in the dot-com bubble back in the year 2000. Hundreds of companies got billions of dollars worth of investment and ended up bankrupt. And also check this out. Here is a list of all of the car companies in history that have ended up going bust. It feels like it just goes on forever. And that's not to say that you shouldn't invest in a car company. You just got to be really careful and remember that it's a risky business. So do look after your money. I like this advice from Charlie Munger, who's Warren Buffett's right hand man, when he says that unless you can put up with one of your stocks or investments dropping 50% in value, then you shouldn't invest in the first place. And I agree that this is a great bit of advice to really think about before you buy anything. Accepting the risk if you wanna get the rewards is really important, but just remember that you can go back to the fundamentals of long-term investing. Do it regularly as much as you can and do it for a really long time into a well-diversified portfolio, and this will really help reduce as much of those risks as possible. Again, this one's up to you and you can invest as risky as you like. Just be aware of them because many people invest and only expecting their stock price to go up and they get angry and scared when they see their investments go down. Risk is just the price of admission that you pay if you want to get into this wonderful world of investing and it's a roller coaster the whole way. And finally, make sure you avoid super risky investments like options, using leverage or trading things like Forex. There's no shortcuts to making money with investing, but there are plenty of people out there who love to take your money selling you the dream. If you can make 10 times your money in one day and it was easy, well, lots of people would do it. But in reality, it's not that easy at all. And the only winners are usually the brokers and the trading platforms who love it when you keep giving them fees for trading over and over again. So if you want to avoid risk, don't take out any loans to buy investment and certainly don't try and short any stocks or play with options, also known as CFDs here in the UK. Some people might make it big, but the vast majority don't. So just be careful out there and take the safer route. But again, it's up to you. Okay, so by now you're probably getting excited at the thought of starting investing, or you might also be continuing what you started. But just before you fully get started, it's well worth getting your house in order before you do. Here's a few bits of advice which are well worth paying attention to. And again, these aren't just my opinion, these are tried and tested by many of the experts in the field. First things first, pay off any high interest debt that you have. I know it sounds boring and you really wanna get started investing, but if you're paying 15%, 20% or even more on a credit card or a loan, 
then paying this off early is a guaranteed way to get a return on your money. That interest rate is set in stone and paying it down faster gives you a saving that you can actually calculate so you know exactly how much you've saved, which is totally different from the investing world because you could get anything, including losing money in any given year. Second up, and probably one of the most important things is to have an emergency fund. All this means is that you should ideally have cash or something close to it that you can get hold of easily in the event of an emergency. Whether it's a car repair, something wrong with your house, or even losing your job. Having an emergency fund really lets you make the right financial decisions without having to sell those investments. And that's the key thing. The advice from various people out there says you should have between three and six months or even more worth of your living costs available to you in an emergency fund that only you use for emergencies. And anytime you dive into it, you've got to top it back up again. Now, personally, I've just got cash in my bank account, but you might want to use high interest savings account or even a separate account just to make sure that you don't touch it. Next point, as we spoke about earlier, only invest money that you can put away for the long term. If you do think you'll need it for the next couple of years, investing's not the best place for it. You could even lose a lot of money if the stock market crashes and you could have some bad luck. So just make sure that you're fine with the idea of long term. One of the worst things that you can do, according to Warren Buffett, is to interrupt the lovely power of compound interest, which is honestly one of the best things that us long-term investors love. And finally in this section, something that doesn't get spoken about much, but think about why you want to invest in the first place. Have some kind of goal. If you don't really have a goal, then when times get tough and you might see your investments losing money, you're a lot more likely to sell or just stop doing it altogether if you don't have something to actually motivate you. So this could be wanting to save for a new car, maybe a deposit for a house, or just retire a few years early. It doesn't matter exactly what it is, but it does matter that you have some kind of goal, even if it's a loose one. I don't really have a fixed goal in mind, but I would like to be able to use my investments eventually to pay for all of my living costs at some point and have the option to retire early, whatever that means. Either way, I'll share all of it on YouTube, so stay posted. Okay, so now we're getting into the practical side of investing. You know what you want to do, you just need to know where you can actually do it. So to get started investing, you'll need to use an investing app or platform, which is basically a broker. In exactly the same way as you do your food shopping and you go to the supermarket to buy your milk, eggs and baked beans, it's the same with investments. You can't unfortunately go to the Heinz factory and grab baked beans. You've got to go to Sainsbury's instead. Now many years ago, you would have to call up a broker, set up an account and do everything over the phone. But luckily those days are all gone now. And most platforms are fully online, either accessed on your computer or by an app on your phone. The best platform for you will depend on what you want in the same way as the best supermarket really depends on your own needs. If you want one with a dedicated butcher, cheese small around the world and those lovely craft beers, then you'll probably have to pay a little bit more for a platform than a simple one, which is going to be more like a budget supermarket focused on low prices. However, whatever you do, make sure you look for a platform that's regulated and protected in the country that you're in. So for example, for us here in the UK, make sure any broker or platform you use is FCA regulated, that's the Financial Conduct Authority. Also look out for the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, which protects your cash up to £85,000 per provider. And if you're watching from the US or Australia or anywhere else, firstly, hello. From a US perspective, just make sure that any broker you use is a member of SIPC. This protects your investments up to $500,000 as I understand it. And also look for FDIC insurance if that's applicable too. Then in Australia, all the way around the world from us right now, check to make sure that the ASIC has your platform listed and make sure you do your own research and look after your own money too. Here's a couple of pointers to help you decide on what kind of platform would be right for you. But also please see the links in the description of the video for the latest offers on platforms that I use and recommended. There's some free cash and shares up for grabs to get you started. So take advantage of those while they last. They can sometimes change at short notice though, so just be aware of that. Okay, onto a few pointers that might help. Firstly, look out for fees. Some platforms might charge you nothing at all and some might charge you a fixed monthly cost or base it on the amount that you've got invested. That's the platform fee. Another thing to look out for is trading fees or commissions. You might get charged every time you make a trade even if you do it once a month just make sure that you understand if this is the case luckily we are seeing more commission free platforms out there but just make sure you understand where the company's making its money as someone has to take on the cost somewhere also, FX fee is another one to keep an eye out for. If we're buying in UK pounds, you need to take into consideration what it means if you're going to buy a US stock or a European one too. Secondly, make sure that you use the right kind of account for you. And we'll talk about this in the next section, but take advantage of any tax-free investing accounts like your Stocks and Shares ISA here in the UK because this will really help invest your money while protecting any gains from those taxes. And don't forget about pension accounts too. That's another area worth looking into and I've got videos on my channel explaining the different kinds of accounts available. Next up, check the features you might want. Does it have an app or is it only available online? Can you buy US shares only or a small selection? Or does it allow you to buy everything? Also, does the platform let you buy fractional shares and ETFs? 
All of these things might be worth considering depending on what you want to do. For example, if you're just going to invest every month into the same index fund, will this cost you a fee or will it be free? And then how does the platform charge you? So just before you choose one, make sure it has what you want. Also, pro tip, you're welcome to have multiple accounts. I do this, but it won't apply to all types of accounts. So just be aware of that. If you're looking for a review of the platforms, I did a video last year on this, which I will link in the description. However, look out for a brand new one I'll do as lots has changed, at least for us here in the UK. So stay posted for that. Make sure you subscribe to the channel too to not miss out. And while you're down there, drop me a like too. Right, sorry to make things more confusing. You might already think choosing a platform to invest is already enough, but making sure that you know the account types is really important. I've got more detailed videos on my channel on this subject, but for now, let's just cover the basics. When you open an investing account, most good platforms will offer you choices on what account you can use. And most of them will also let you open more than one account. So see here, for example, if I go to the Vanguard UK website, it will offer me all kinds of accounts, everything from a personal pension, a stocks and shares ISA, a junior ISA, or a general investing account, sometimes shortened to GIA. Generally speaking, I'd say that it's worth making the most of your ISA account. This stands for Individual Savings Account, and here in the UK, across all of the different ISAs, each UK adult can invest up to £20,000 per tax year. There's multiple ISA accounts, sorry to make things more confusing, but the one we'll focus on will be the stocks and shares ISA. There is a cash ISA too, but that's designed to save cash and not invest. So for example, let's just say that you did have £20,000 set ready to invest. I know it's probably not going to happen, but play along anyway. You could put £5,000 into a cash ISA for safekeeping, maybe one offered by your bank with a high interest rate, and then you could put another £15,000 into your stocks and shares ISA using a platform like Invest Engine or Trading212. Once you've done that, you're then free to invest that money as you see fit. But the main benefits are that any gains you make or any dividends that you're paid are going to be tax free. After you've been investing for a long time, this will be really important because it would mean that you could withdraw your money once you sell your investments and not have to pay any taxes on your gains that you've made. So make the most of that account where you can. If you do use a general investing account, that's fine, but just be aware of what allowances you get from the government before you are liable for taxes each year. At the last budget statement, the dividend and capital gains tax allowances are set to decrease over the next two years for us in the UK. I did a video on this recently too, if you're interested. For very long-term investing though, just be careful and try and use your ISA where you can or look into creating a pension too. This also has other benefits that I won't go into, but that's another way to get some tax benefits. If any of this is confusing, don't worry, there's plenty of help on my channel for you. And I also share all of my portfolios where I actually have my own pension account called a SIP my stocks and shares ISA, as well as a couple of general investing accounts. So you can actually see what they look like in a real account. It's simple once you get it, but I totally get that all of this might seem a bit overwhelming at first. Okay, what's next? Well, hopefully you're in a better position than when you started watching this video and you understand a lot more than you did, but I realize that there's still a lot to take in, which is why I have a huge amount of other videos on my channel going into some of those subjects in more detail. I'll put up on screen now an entire playlist which contains lots of investing for beginners videos here that you can take your time on and go through as you see fit. But if you feel like you're already raving to go and you're wondering what some of the best index funds might be, then check out one of my most popular videos going through a small selection which I think could be a great start for you. I think you'll find this one useful and any questions, drop them below in the comments. And with that said, please leave me a like on the way out, subscribe for more, and as always, happy investing.